because if I don't start the recording, then I have to redo this lecture without everyone. So uh, thanks for, for joining us here today. Sorry for the late notice. Um, but my, my version of the story here is that the, let me see if I get this right, uh, the touch screen that controls all of the projection and input and output sources in our classroom is broken. And not only is it broken, it's so old, they don't even make them anymore. And so they're going to have to buy a new one or pay a specialist to come fix it. And that is going to take time and money that is not part of the budget. So it remains unclear where we will be meeting. Um, what I learned in my previous class is that our house internet may not be good enough for me to pull this off from home. So I may end up having to hold Zoom from my office because the odds of us finding an open classroom that holds this many people, that has all the tech that I need this late in the semester, I'm not optimistic. So I will let you know where we are going to be, but expect it to possibly be Zoom for the next few classes, at least until this gets sorted out. Um, we have class on Tuesday of next week. We do not have class on Thursday of next week because I'm out of town. And I think the following week they were taking over the classroom for comps anyway. So we're like, we're going to be, you know, off cycle for various reasons, but we will make this work. So at least now I only have one screen to look at as opposed to people and screen. So it's, it's a little bit easier actually. Uh, thank you for the uh, things in the chat. We've been so for those of you who are just joining us, make sure yes, I am recording. We were talking about um, the paper that broke uh, psychology Twitter yesterday. That econometricians have discovered that people can use uh, Likert scales. I'm going to say it properly to label their feelings, and also people who are reinventing integration. So what's old is new again. I'm guessing that that. Uh, paper though that's causing all the attention there's going to be like 8,000 commentaries coming up so watch for those because it's even more fun when people start yelling at each other in papers like you didn't invent this colon you know and then some better title so those are always fun um okay so let's see I'm trying to get, get my bearings here I don't think I have any schedule stuff or announcements I have not put up anything new for an example that goes with this unit yet because we have a long ways to go, unfortunately, before I can show you an example. There's just a lot of background that it takes to, to figure all the stuff out before the M plus and R output would make any kind of sense. So it's going to be slides for a little while. Uh, what do you remember from last time? What's the new magic word that everybody should now have as part of their vocabulary? It starts with an L. Link function, ooh, I didn't think of that one. You're right though, that is a new magic word. I was thinking of a particular link function, but yeah, logit is the one I was thinking of, yeah. And what's another one? What's another link function we talked about? It starts with probit, yeah, otherwise known as ogive, yeah. So what are they for? Like in a broad sense, what is their purpose? When would you invoke them? If the outcome is bounded, yeah, the predicts to keep the predicted outcomes from going out of bounds to con transform the conditional mean into an unbounded metric to be predicted. I will take that one as well. So the idea of a link function is that it changes what we're, the model is predicting into something that can can be predicted linearly. So if we're predicting an outcome in logits or probits, then the slope can keep going forever and ever in both directions and it's not a problem. Because when we back translate into the original data metric, so going from model scale to data scale is one way to say that, going from the link function to the inverse link function is another way to say that, going from logits back down to probabilities, in this case, the predicted probabilities will stay within zero and one as they need to for the analysis to make sense. So we're talking about binary data. The same is true for ordinal data though. Like when you have the possible answers of one, two, three, four, five, your model should understand that it shouldn't predict a response below one or a response above five. And the way that it does that is using the same logit technology or the same probit technology, just with a couple of twists. So anytime we're predicting an outcome that's bounded, 
where we need the slopes essentially to shut off as we approach the boundaries, that's when you would use a link function. Um, what's the other piece that we're changing with respect to the E's? If we're predicting binary data, what do we need to do with respect to the E's at the end of the equation? Yeah, Bernoulli them. I like that one. Way to make it a verb. We're changing out the distribution. So no one ever said everything had to be normal. The E's have to be normal if that's what you ordered for your model, but we'll just change our order. So we'll change it to Bernoulli, which is a distribution that has only zeros and ones. It also has only a mean and not a variance. So in Bernoulli, the proportion of ones times the proportion of zeros is the variance, and it necessarily shrinks as we get further and further away from a probability of 0.5. So there's no more E's at the end of the equation, not because the model's perfect, but because we don't have E as an estimated parameter representation. So the E is like, is like cueing us in that this is a parameter in the model, it's variance, we don't have that in these. So it's gone, at least for, for now. It'll probably stay gone for quite a while. Um, let me get the screen share going since we have done our little happy little review. There we go, and I'll move this thing out of the way. Okay, can everyone see my slides? We're good with the screen share? Yes, okay. Am I frozen yet? Not yet? Not yet, okay, this is good. So far, so good. So I have a slide nine up to remind us of this idea of how we map probability into logits, where the model will predict the logit using a standard linear model, and that will become unequal distances in probability in terms of the transition between uh, predicted values here. So a predicted logit going from zero to one is a bigger jump in probability than a predicted logit going from one to two and so forth. So in terms of the neutral point, probability of 0.5 corresponds to odds of one corresponds to logit of zero. So if I have a logit for the probability of a one, that is 3.6. What's my logit for the probability of a zero instead? So if I have a logit of 3.6 for the probability of a one, what's my corresponding logit for a probability of a zero instead? Any guesses? There's no math involved. And the answer is not on the slide either, for once. Uh, not one. So I'll tell you again, logit of 3.6 corresponds to the probability of a one, then what would the probability of a zero have to be? Yeah, negative 3.6. Mm -hmm. They differ in sign. So this is, a, this is a really important point to emphasize because this is the difference in how models are phrased. Some models are going to have what looks like an intercept and would correspond to the logit for a probability of one. And some models are going to have the opposite, what's known as a threshold, which corresponds to the logit of a probability of a zero. But to get back and forth, you just multiply that number by minus one. All right, so we talked about, I did a little bit of stuff with logistic regression in which you would be predicting like one item response just to introduce the idea of this link function and swapping out the conditional distribution, which is the basis of how confirmatory factor analysis relates to item factor analysis and item response theory. Probit is another potential link function that makes use of z-scores instead. So it uses a standard normal distribution, and the link function is the z-score that goes with the area to the left of your corresponding probability. So probit's on a different scale. Probit and logit differ from each other by a factor of 1.7, but otherwise they do the same thing in basically the same way. Uh, we left off with, let's see, slide 20, I think. Does that sound about right? This is the one where we're doing uh, fun with vocabulary names. 
So in terms of what these models are called, I'll start here and go back over this since this was at the tail end of class here. Uh, question first though, is estimating the model the same as the calibration process? I would say yes. Calibration is the term that gets used in IRT, but I would say estimation if what you're trying to do is find the numbers that make the data most likely. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Sure, and I'm not sure why we need a different word for it, but you know, that's just part and partial of, uh, of statistics and quantitative methods. <laughs> yeah, there, so... <laughs> yes, it, you and me both, honestly, um, and that's why this is it, this is more challenging than it needs to be because the the factor analysis tradition and the words and everything that go with that are completely separate from the IRT tradition and the words that go with that because they're different people made for different purposes in different places and trying to put them together requires a lot of this is to this is this is to this kind of conversion. But yes, I think calibration and estimation are functionally the same. Uh, there may be subtleties that I'm not privy to, so that could be a Jonathan question if, if he has a different answer. But I think the process of finding the numbers is what I refer to as a more general operating policy. So that then, yeah, so does that help? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So estimation then. And this is a distinction that is really only relevant for categorical data, by the way. Uh, this distinction of full information versus limited information. In CFA, the only time that would matter would be missing data. Um, you would do full information if you had missing data and you could get away with limited if you didn't. But otherwise, if you're dealing with complete data, the estimation using full information versus limited would land you in exactly the same place, which is why we never really talked about this as a thing in CFA. In the world of categorical responses, that is not true. So broadly speaking, when you see the term full information, what that means is that what goes into the estimation procedure is all of the original information. All of the original item responses per each subject go in as data in order to find the height of the data given the model parameters and to figure out which model parameters make the data the tallest. The formula for height has to change, right? It's a Bernoulli formula for height rather than normal, but it's the same process of finding the height. Limited information means that the original data first gets summarized, and that summary is what goes into the analysis. So for instance, you can do confirmatory factor analysis using published data if they give you the, the response means the response variances, and either the covariances or the correlations. You can redo someone's entire analysis and make up new models for their data if you have that summary level information. It is possible, and back when this all started in the late, what, 60s, 70s, that's how people did it. In categorical data, what happens for limited information is the first step is summarizing all of the item responses into a type of covariance matrix but it's not a usual covariance matrix. It's not based on Pearson. It's based on something else, which is called tetrachoric, if you're in binary item land, or polychoric, if you are in ordinal data land. Those uh, descriptions of those are forthcoming because it's, it's not relevant yet, because it's just a different way of getting to the, the answer at points. But this process of summarizing and then doing something on the summary to fit the model, that's the distinction here. And so the way that I see people use these words um, corresponds to this estimation distinction as well as how the model is parameterized. Um, I know that's kind of a mouthful. I'm trying to think of another word that's similar. Uh, formulated, maybe? How, what the model parameters are and what they mean. So in the same way that you can have, you know, the logit is the outcome or the odds is the outcome or the probability is the outcome and you can rearrange them into each other. There are two distinct ways that people talk about these types of models. One is phrased as discrimination and difficulty, which are known as letters. So there's an A parameter and a B parameter. And if those are the way, if those parameters are the way that you're specifying the item level model, then you're doing item response theory, IRT. 
and that combination of A and B parameters plus full information maximum likelihood is what that's what's the, those are the words that would go along with those choices. The other way of doing it is much more directly aligned to factor analysis because that's the tradition that it came out of the slope intercept form of the model or in M plus slope threshold form of the model where thresholds and intercepts are off by minus one. That version of the model then, uh, what people typically would do with that is limited information estimation because they're using a factor analysis program to do it. So item factor analysis is the name for that. See also CFA for categorical responses, that's IFA. So those words all mean the same thing. And in M plus, you can do any of these four boxes. So you can ask for A and B parameters for binary models, for instance, with either type of estimation. For ordinal models, it doesn't give you the A's and B's, but you can get them by writing new parameters, which I'll show you how to do. In Levon, Levon only does limited information. So that's why we can't use Levon for everything in this class. You would have to switch to a different package like MERT if you wanted to do full information and get the uh, loadings and thresholds or the A's and B's, but the full information would be the thing that would make you switch packages. However, what a package like MERT cannot do, to, as far as I know, is become a structural equation model. Like you can use it to calibrate your IRT models and get item parameters out and probably get theta predictions back out, but then you can't see in a latent variable way how those thetas are related to other stuff. So you can't do the structural model part within the that package. So that's why I'm favoring M plus is because it's the only way that I know to do all of the things and to have all the estimation choices that would potentially be relevant. So hopefully this table will help you understand why I'm using two different sets of words and what will make this unit take the longest, I think, is, is trying to understand how the two versions of the model relate to each other and what the parameters mean. And I do really want you to appreciate the distinctions because then you'll know what to do with your parameters once you get them out of your software. It's like, am I looking at A's and B's or am I looking at loadings, thresholds, or intercepts? Like it's one of those five things. Uh, question, do I have example or visual of how WLSMV is calculated? Um, I have a visual of how tetrachoric correlations are calculated, but I don't want to do it yet. If, if, if I can, if I can play the instructor card, it's, it's like slide like 87 or something. So <laughs> we're a ways away for now. If you can just trust me that numbers come back and it's fine. And then, then the, where the numbers come from will, will be a little bit later because I want to, I want to get to the definition of the models and what the terms mean and how the way that they, how these models necessarily have to make us think about reliability in a different way. That's the other piece of it, is because what makes an item good is different in this framework. It has to be. Yes, thank you for your patience. Always thank you for your patience. Okay. Uh, Lisa? Yes, hit me. Uh, when we go over the output, can you also mention the threshold version again? Because uh, you mm -hmm. said that M plus gives us that version. Yep and how that links to what you talked about earlier. A threshold is an intercept times minus one, is the short answer. Yeah. The, the, the longer answer is forthcoming. But right. it, the, yeah, the, the bigger picture here is that at this point, it becomes tricky to figure out exactly what your output means. Because you have to know, is this an IFA parameterization? Is it an IRT parameterization? If it's an IFA, are they using intercepts or are they using thresholds? And how is your latent factor scaled? Because then that changes what the parameters mean. So that it gets trickier to interpret the results at this point. But yes, we will, we will definitely have examples and get practice with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so then in terms also of how the models are written, if you write the model in terms of predicted logits, it, it will look like this type of linear model. If you write it in terms of probability, it will look like this, e to the model over one plus e to the model. And so that's another reason why these things tend to look different. Not only do they have different parameters, come back, no, 
Hang on. I'm going the wrong way. And then of course it has, it takes its time advancing. All right, one more, there we go. Not only do they have different parameters, but they also then are expressed in different ways. So I, I've debated this back and forth like 8,000 times in my head, and then I end up usually just staying with what I have. What, here's what I want to do. I want to do IRT first. There are two reasons for that. Um, historically, the reason that I've done IRT first is because I think that version of the model parameters is more useful. I think A's and B's are just more directly useful to know than alternatives. The second reason that I want to do IRT first is because I'm in Iowa and IRT is a thing here. You know, we have an educational measurement program that's been around for decades and that's one of the things that it's known for is training students to go work in the testing industry. And a lot of testing industries, IRT is their bread and butter. So it has a, a prominence here that is unique to this place. But even if I didn't work here, and before I worked here, in fact, I started with IRT because I think the parameters are just more useful. That being said, the, the models are gonna look different than things that you're used to seeing. And, and so part of that is just, you just gotta like, gotta trust me that this is still factor analysis. Okay, do you believe me? I'm not gonna lie to you. I might accidentally lie to you, but never on purpose. This is still factor analysis. It's just gonna look different. So, away we go then. So IRT models to start with, including one, two, three, and four parameters, and how the word Rosh relates to those distinctions. So here's our very first IRT model. It is indeed the simplest IRT model that one could entertain. It is known as a one parameter model because, can you guess why? It has one item parameter in it. It actually has two parameters, but one of them goes with items and the other goes with people. And if you are working with a logit link function, then you would attach the word logistic to it. So what people will say this is called is a 1PL. One parameter logistic link function. And it's designed for binary responses. So that's where we are right now, binary. So here's two different ways of writing the model where the left-hand side is what distinguishes these two equations. So the top equation is written in logits. The bottom equation is written in probabilities. And the right-hand side is just these two things where theta, what's theta again? New vocabulary word from last time. The way in factor. Mm -hmm. That's our factor score. So that's our, our latent trait, our latent construct, latent variable, factor, uh, true score, whatever word you want. Ability, yep. The thing you're trying to measure with your items, that's theta. So in this class, we're using S subscripts for subjects. So theta is a person characteristic, subject characteristic, minus B. So the minus is something that I've, I never see anywhere else but this. Most linear models, when you build them like a regression model, everything is plus. This is the one instance in which it is a minus. And the reason for that is that B is a fixed effect for item difficulty. So it's an item specific thing. So the notation system that is common, and this isn't mine, this is like your standard notation, it doesn't actually tell you from looking at it, what is fixed and what is random. But theta is random. So that means that we don't actually need each person's theta to solve this equation. All we need to know is the distribution of theta and we will know that because we have to fix it to have a mean and a variance, the same as we had to do in factor analysis. The item difficulty is a fixed effect. And that means that each item gets a distinct version of its own B. The discrepancy between what your ability is and how difficult the item is, is what creates your score. So the definition of B is the location on the trait at which the probability of a correct response is 50-50. 
So if you have more ability than the item is difficult, your logit will be positive and your probability of getting it right or endorsing it if it's not an ability construct would be greater than 50-50. If you have less ability than the item is difficult, then that creates a negative logit, which means you're more likely to get it wrong. And so at this point, the minus sign makes it so that difficulty really is difficulty. Higher values mean you are more likely to get it wrong or to not endorse it. So items that are high in difficulty take a lot of the trait to be able to get it right or to endorse it. So this is a location parameter and I think it's the most useful version because it tells you essentially like where on the theta distribution this item is located. All right, doing okay so far. Checking to see if I'm frozen and or being comprehensible. Not frozen at least. Okay, excellent. So what do these things mean then? The idea of conjoint scaling is the first thing here. So back in the world of, uh, of regular testing, you would have to know what the scale is for a test, like what a possible highest value is, what a possible lowest value is to interpret what a given number result would be. So for instance, if Huey comes home and he has a test and he shows me his test and he says, mommy, mommy, I got a 12. Um, good? I, I have to ask some follow-up questions. I'm basing if he comes home and he's happy that a 12 is good, but I might ask out of how many? Or what did Kale get? Which is, you know, a, an older child at his school, his personal hero. And if he said, well, you know, that puts me in the 90th percentile. Great, a 12 is good then. But if a 12 puts you into the 10th percentile, then a 12 is not good. But this idea that we can't know like just immediately what it means, it has to have a reference relative to the rest of the population. So in IRT, we don't necessarily have that problem because the definition of the item and the definition of ability are put onto the same metric to where they both inform each other. And I have an example of this, which is admittedly dated, um, but I'm dated. So my example of this is a knowledge of a latent trait that is 80s pop culture. And I thought about updating this to be like the 90s or the 2000s, but honestly, I couldn't come up with any good examples because I don't have any content knowledge in those domains. So we do 80s pop culture here. So as an example here, I have the person side and the item side of my construct map. So a person of low ability, for instance, on my latent domain of 80s culture would be like my mom. And she might be familiar with be able to correctly identify with 50% probability the 80s song Mickey, which is the Tony Basil song. Do, do you, does anyone remember this song? The Zoom environment is not ideal to try out this bit, but I'll ask. The song is, oh, Mickey, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind. Hey, Mickey. Hey, Mickey. A few people, yeah. You may have heard it like, you know, played elsewhere, even if you weren't around when it was developed, but like someone like my mom would have at least a 50% chance of identifying that song correctly. She's low ability, but it's a, it's a fairly common reference. I would say the average adults, you know, somebody who is probably middle aged like myself could probably successfully name all of the Cosby kids on that sitcom that was very popular when I was a kid. Would anyone like to try? Without going to the internet, I should say, because that's cheating. For the, the Cosby show? Yeah, go for it. There's Theo, there's there. Rudy, yeah. there's uh, mm -hmm. Boy Howdy, Claire. Uh, Claire's the mom. Oh, it's for the kids. Yep. Um, yeah, I'll take that. I say Cosby kids, okay. but yeah, Claire Claire, and, and uh, Heathcliff Huxtable, of course, for the parents. Vanessa, yep. We got, we got Theo and Rudy and Vanessa. There's at least one more. No, two more. The older siblings. Are we, are we empty with our answers? There is Denise, who is Lisa Bonet's character. 
and Sandra is the oldest sister. Those are the other ones. And then, of course, when the show started to tank, that's when they invited Raven Simone to join as the cute little Olivia. But she was, I believe, Denise's stepdaughter, so it does not technically count as one of the original Cosby children. But anyway, like, like the question of that level of difficulty, I'd say someone who's my age who grew up with the show could probably answer those questions. Uh, the average undergraduate would know who the character Ducky is from the movie Pretty in Pink. So this is John Cryer in one of his original roles. If you haven't seen that movie, I would recommend. It's probably on every streaming service at this point because it is uh, so ubiquitous. But Ducky is like the original, like, like unrequited love of the main character. You know, he was stuck in the friend zone. Eventually at the end of the movie, good things happened to him al alternatively. But Ducky is one of my favorite characters. Uh, my, my younger brother, who's four years younger than me, he once tried to stump me with this trivia question of who was the other guy in the band Wham? The famous person in Wham, of course, being George Michael. Excellent singer and artist. I believe he is now deceased. But the other guy in Wham was Andrew Ridgely, and I don't believe he has gone on to further fame, so that's fairly an obscure reference. And the last one that I had, which I put myself at the top of this continuum as one of the few things that I, I know about in life, where did Alf live? What planet was Alf from? Does anyone recall this tiny pit of trivia from the 80s? There was a TV show called Alf, and it was another one. It was like people in costumes, like it wasn't animated. Yeah, he was from the planet Melmac. So this is the kind of information that resides in my brain. I don't know anything about history or art or science or geography or politics or culture. Like basically all the other trivial pursuit sections, you don't want me on your team. This is the one thing that I have. But I like this example because we can talk about the difficulty of knowing these things, like how you know random they are, how common they are, and the type of person who I would expect to have that level of ability to meet that challenge. And none of these items, we had to refer to numbers. I don't need to label these things with numbers to get that point across. And eventually, yeah, these things are all going to have numbers, but the numbers that they are going to have is arbitrary. In the same way that when we set the metric of the latent factor, that metric is arbitrary. It turns out, folks in the IRT world took the same strategy as folks in the CFA world, so maybe that's not a coincidence, where the most common approach to setting the metric of these things is to say that theta has a mean of zero and a variance of one. So then someone at an average level of ability would have a zero, an item of that corresponding level then, its item difficulty would be the point on theta where there's a 50-50 probability of getting that item right. So the numerical scale is shared between the two sides of this conjoint scaling is the, the main picture here. So this is a, uh, another example using the construct of um, basically activities of daily living in older adults, so like what things you would need to do to be able to retain your independence. So this is from the Embertson and Reese textbook, which is several chapters of which are on, on your reading list here. And she's describing in this chapter the idea that if all you have is a standard score or a test score, you could compare people relative to each other, but that doesn't answer the question as to what they can do. So like I would say that based on these hypothetical names, you know, Anna is relatively worse off than these three other people, but knowing that she has a standard score in this range doesn't tell me if Anna needs help with what kind of activities, like what does it mean to be of a low ability? Whereas something like this helps to make it a lot more concrete. So this is a different way of presenting the same type of information where what the bottom of this picture shows are the items along the continuum at various levels of difficulty. So for instance, the lowest level of difficulty would be that you have bowel control and it moves up through grooming and be, being able to dress yourself, being able to get out of chairs, bathtubs, etc., walking, with the highest difficulty item being stairs. So this is obviously a scale meant for folks who would have some kind of physical limitation, be it because of age or whatever other type of disability that, that somebody may experience in their life. 
and you're trying to figure out like where someone is on this continuum. Well, here in this case, like if I know that Anna's theta was estimated by her item responses to be here, then she has a 50-50 shot at being able to groom herself, but she has less than a 50% chance to do any of these other things. And once we predict what a theta estimate for Anna would be, we can then predict what her probability of being able to do any of the stuff would be based on that. So the items and the people are aligned onto the same metric that once you give it a scale, then you can interpret what people can do based on what their score represents. So I think that's pretty cool. All right, let me pause here for a second, make sure I'm not frozen and that I'm making sense. Not frozen, okay, step one or at least making sense a little bit. So fo folks of you who, who've had IRT before, good, thumbs for sense. Or folks of you who haven't, what questions do you have? Or is this all just like, yeah, we know this already, move on. Because we know this already, move on is fine, if that's the answer. Or I understand everything so far and this seems reasonable to me. Thumbs up. All right. I will keep keep rolling then. That's what we'll do. So the there's expressions that people use to describe um, IRT parameters and that estimates are person free or item free or the terms that are in um, Susan's book is sample free and scale free. And it's the same idea that we first saw in CFA that you are breaking the tie between persons and items by allowing a separate latent trait to be a model parameter that is not just the sum of the item responses. So once you have a collection of item responses and you've estimated a model that results in these item parameters and then you can predict thetas if you want to do that, so once you've calibrated the model, I guess is another way to say it, then Theta estimates should be comparable and interpretable across multiple samples if all if everything is on the same scale. So if they're using like a joint calibration across samples, or if you are using item parameters and treating them as if they're known, and then scoring other people using a known set of parameters, then you can make comparisons regardless. So it's not tied to the particular items that a person answered necessarily that gives you tremendous flexibility because then not everybody has to answer every question. And that can be on purpose to create a test that's more efficient, or it could be by accident if you know, you're trying to compare results across samples and people chose to give a different version of an instrument than you did. So while it isn't technically possible that you can think of these estimates as sort of scale-free or person-free, that is not true of their standard errors. So the quality of each of the estimates depends on having enough data relevant at that point. So if you're talking about item difficulty, you can try to estimate what item difficulty is, but if you have an item that's really, really difficult, so you don't have very many people likely at that corresponding level of ability, then the standard error for that item difficulty is gonna be big. Because it's like, I think it should be somewhere out here, but I'm not really sure because I don't have a lot of information. Likewise, if you have somebody with a very high ability, but most of the items are too easy for them, then you can't know very well how, how high they are. You don't have a lot of information with which to nail down exactly where they are, so their standard error is going to be higher. So the... The consequences of, of measurement imprecision happen here too. So it depends on having enough information at all the points to be able to estimate everything across the full range of difficulty. So that is one of the motivators for adaptive tests or tests where we are targeting items to specific levels of difficulty is to try and reduce that standard error, not waste people's time with items that are too easy or too hard and try and narrow in on items that will be most useful for nailing down exactly where a person is on this data continuum. All right, so here then is the same model, adding a parameter that's not really a parameter, but it's setting us up to add one. Another way of writing the same model is to introduce a constant out front 
that is literally a constant. It does not have a subscript, which means it is estimated to be the same across items. It's this A parameter. So sometimes you will see the 1PL model, the one parameter model written like this, where the idea that differences between items and how useful they are, how good they are, is foreshadowed, I would say, with this idea here. So another way of thinking about the one parameter model is that it is a constrained model in which the relationship between the item response and theta is assumed to be equal across items. The relationship, come back, the relationship between the response and theta is this A parameter here. So A is going to become item discrimination. So it starts with B and then we add A for reasons that I don't know, it's backwards. But item discrimination is the same idea as a factor loading. And in certain models, they will literally be the same number. It is how strongly related the latent trait is to the item response. So what do you think the worst A could be is? What do you think the worst value that A could hold is? <laughs> Try not to say B is a verb and a parameter in the same sentence. Zero, yeah. So A would translate, if it were zero, into doesn't matter how much ability you have, that doesn't change your predicted probability of getting this item right. So an A of zero would be like a slope of zero, would be like a loading of zero. Like that's a bad item that's not related to your trait. How about a negative A? Could you have that? Could you have negative no. discrimination? No? Monotonicity assumption. Well, if each item got a different A, it could. But in this model, that's tr that's probably true. It means your trade's upside down. But yeah, in theory, you like items could be related backwards, and that means not only is it a bad item, but it's working in the opposite way. Um, if they're all bad, then that's a whole different ball of wax. I'm getting ahead of myself because it's this distinction right here that I'm trying to prepare you for: is A versus A sub I. The one parameter model has an A in it, it's just assumed to be equal across items. Uh, another way of saying it is that this is a tau equivalent model. It's the same thought. The idea that we are saying, without testing, that all of the items are equally related to the latent trait, equally discriminating, by putting a constant slope out here. So, yeah. Sorry, but that A parameter which is constant, do we have to calculate that parameter, or it is fixed at the beginning? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think this is coming on later slides, but let me say it now because you're already prepared for it. Do you remember model identification in CFA, where we had to give each factor a mean and a variance somehow? And for the variance, what were our two choices for giving a factor a variance scale? What were the two things we could do? Yeah, we can fix the variance to a number like one, which is the most common, or we can fix one of the item loadings, which is known as a marker item, to have a loading fixed at one. Guess what our choices are here? The same thing. So the answer to whether A needs to be found depends on what how you're setting up your scale. Either theta has a variance of one, and A has to be found as one common number across all the items, or A is one, and you estimate theta's variance. Thank you. Thank you. Which is going to make it fit better? Trick question. The standard I use uh, so if, if I say A is 1 and I'm going to estimate the theta factor variance, is that going to fit better than if I say, no, 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 if theta factor variance is 1 and I'm going to estimate A? Yeah, they're the same. You're just changing what, what the definition of the scale is. They're the same. So picking a different key. 
So this, I don't know how well known this is in certain parts of psychometrics, but it's one of those things that I think can make it more confusing as to when these models are the same or not the same. Either there is a common estimated A and theta variance is one, or A is one and the theta variance is estimated, but it will fit the same either way. Um, another thing that you may see floating out front in front of these equations sometimes is the number 1.7. Does that still show up in IRT land, those of you who just finished that class? Does the 1.7 show up in your equations? Yeah. Sometimes? I think it does. Yeah, so like I remember this being another thing. I was like, what the hell is that there for? Yeah, in the, in the, um, what is it, the intercept slope version of the model, like in MERT models, right? It shows up in that, I think. Uh, and a few other things. Uh, this is probit to logit. That's what that's for. So it is used to take coefficients on a probit scale and scale them up to where they'd be on a logit scale. That's what it's for. It's, it's that conversion. And once upon a time, M plus had factored out the 1.7 so that all of the results in their logit models were still on probit scale. And then like halfway through their, I think it was maybe version six, they changed it. And I just remember that made me so mad because that one switch made me have to redo like every single handout because now all the numbers were wrong and all of my formulas were wrong. And I was like, ah, why did you do this to me? So it was one of those days where I was grateful to have a spouse who is in the field with me because all I had to say is M plus took the 1.7 out. He's like, are you kidding me? Because then he instantly understood why I was so angry. So the 1.7, just watch for it. That's another thing that you may see floating around in there. It is a logit to probit translation mechanism. That is what it is for. So here's some pictures. The uh, one parameter model, did I get to Ross yet? Do I have that vocabulary in here? Uh, yeah, I had it up here. I forgot to say it though. Uh, by the way, this one parameter model is also known as a Rosh model. That is a person's name. But it is also an entire section of the psychometric community that has a very different way of thinking about how to choose between possible models. Uh, a Rosh framework is like, no, the items have to be equally discriminating or else this doesn't make any sense. An IRT person would be like, are you sure? Because to me, it seems like a testable hypothesis. I am much more of the latter, in case you couldn't guess. But this one parameter model then, this is the type of predictions that it would make across distinct items. So this picture shows on the x-axis the latent trait theta. And for the sake of these pictures, we'll say that it has a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. So I'm showing plus or minus three standard deviations. The y-axis is the probability of getting a one instead of a zero. And these are predictions for different, four different items. And these curves are known as item characteristic curves to be abbreviated as an ICC for short and I'm sorry, that is not the same thing as intraclass correlation, which is what ICC also means. So you have to know the context to know what that abbreviation stands for. But the idea is that these are showing the relationship between the trait and the predicted probability, where the items differ only in their location on the trait, only in their B difficulty parameter. So the dark blue item here, B1, has a difficulty of minus two because that is the amount of the trait that you need to have a 50-50 probability of getting a one. That is the definition of difficulty, is how much trait you need to have a 50-50 shot at getting this right. So the pink item then has a difficulty that is minus one instead. That is where that item's curve crosses the y-axis the blue, light blue is a difficulty of zero and then the green is positive one. So which of these items is the most difficult? One, two, three, or four? Lots of answers, four, yes. So difficulty is actually difficulty. That's why I'm asking this question. 
Up to this point, difficulty was actually easiness in which higher values meant you were more likely to get it right. Now this is higher values mean you're less likely to get it right. So this green item then, in terms of where it would differentiate along the theta continuum, this green item is going to be most informative, most dis discriminating for people who are relatively high on the trait level. Amongst people who are below average, differences in the trait don't really translate into differences in the predicted probability. So this item isn't going to help sort out the low people. It's designed to help sort out the medium to highish people. Likewise, the purpose of this dark blue item number one here is to sort out the people on the low side. The people who have a high enough theta are basically going to get this right regardless of how high they are. So this item is not useful. So the consequence in terms of these curves being nonlinear, so they have to shut off because we can't go below a probability of zero or above a probability of one. But the consequence of that is that it changes how we think about these items and who they're for. So which of these is the best item? Let me say it that way. Yeah, they're all the same. And the reason I would say they are all the same is because the slopes are all the same. Yeah, best for whom? So I would have to say for whom, but in terms of across the board, even though each of these is targeting a different range of difficulty, their slopes are the same. So once we say, once we adjust for these differences in location and say, okay, green is for the, the high ability people and pink is for the lower people and so forth, they work equally well within their respective ranges. Uh, question from Vladimir. Yes, uh, just to be sure that I understand this, if, if, if we would like to compare this with the CPA things that we have learned, mm -hmm. in this case, we could assume that this latent trait uh, would be the factor, mm -hmm. this, the, this beast would be the item intercept not quite. Okay. It be, yeah, Bs are related to the intercepts, but they're not the same. Uh, okay. But, okay. but can... Yeah. would be the same? Yes. Whatever the numbers, and but, finally, the other variances will be related to the info, item information functions? Um, the error variances don't exist because we're using a Bernoulli distribution where error is determined by the mean. So, so error variances are not parameters here. The factor loadings are the slopes, are the A parameters, and those will be the same within a scaling constant. Um, if you set up your model so that theta's variance is one, they will be the same. If you, in the CFA version of this versus the, the IFA to IRT conversion. The intercept is related to difficulty, but it's, a, it, but it's not the same. Um, I can tell you how they're related, but this may, this may hurt more than it helps. So the B parameters, the location parameters are B, are tied to where Y is zero, and B gives you the X value at which Y is zero. That's what B tells you. B tells you the X value where Y is zero, where Y is in logits. So remember, probability of 50-50 is a logit of zero. An intercept is the exact opposite. The intercept tells you the y value when x is zero. And this is coming in like 50 slides or something. This is where we get into the difference between the models. But yes, what you can, what you can take with you for right now is that an a is to a factor loading as b is related to an intercept, but they're phrased in slightly different ways but they're both location parameters. And the reason I would say these items are all equally good is because they have uh, equal slopes. But then I would also have to say good for whom. They're only good for the people within their range where the slope is actually active. Thank you. Thank you. And Nathan, I think a few minutes ago you said specific objectivity. Yeah, that's a key word. That's a Rosh word. And because these items have equal slopes, it implies that these curves will never cross. 
So items like the green item will always be hard hardest. And the next item, item three will always be next hardest. Like that won't change. And that is viewed as a desirable characteristic. And in general, I would agree with you, except when your data don't support that assumption. Which is coming next. I figured that was next. Okay, any other questions before we add a parameter? Okay, so at the very end of your homework, uh, homework two, which is in progress right now, and at the very end of example four, we did model comparisons where we took our CFA model and we constrained all of the loadings to be equal. Do you remember this? Or you will remember this after you work on homework two. And what did we do to decide if that was acceptable as a constraint? If we modify the model so that all the items have equal loadings, how would we decide if that's okay or not? If uh, you do an, a, lot of, uh, boy, a likelihood ratio test and it ends up um, not being as worse as the model uh, with freely let it, letting the loadings do whatever they want. Yep. Yeah, so you can say either difference in log likelihood or likelihood ratio test, either one of those works. And if we start with a model where all the items have different loadings and we force them to be the same, then yes, we got, we're either making it worse or not worse. Guess what we're going to do to decide if parallel slopes is okay here or whether they need to be different? Same thing! Likelihood ratio test for the win. So whether or not the data support this idea that items are equally discriminating, to me, is a testable hypothesis. To Rosh people, that's just craziness, and they would never be cool with it. So under that, well, let's see what the data want. Here's the next model. Continuing the tradition of clever names, the one parameter model becomes a two parameter model. And we're still in a logit link, so it would be two parameter logistic. And the difference is in one tiny little subscript. So the common A switches to A sub I. That means that each item gets a different discrimination, a different slope. Each item can be differentially useful in measuring the trait. It is still the case that items are differentially useful based on their location, but this is another layer to that. At items at the same location, the one that has a stronger slope is the better item. So item discrimination is either, if you're talking in logits, it's just the slope, like the end, because this model is linear in the logit, right? The slope operates on the difference between difficulty and ability constantly in linear logit land. When you translate that A parameter into probability, then you have to say it's the slope at the item difficulty point where it crosses 50-50 specifically, or the maximum slope on the S-shaped curve. Uh, so yes, to me, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do but to others, it is not. Here's a picture that explains why people might have a problem with this. So now I've got four items here, and items one and two share the same difficulty. So items one and two have a difficulty value of minus one, which is the amount of the trait that it takes to have a 50-50 probability. The other two items that are in the pinky purple color have a difficulty of zero instead, so they are more difficult. It takes a theta of zero to have a 50-50 probability for them. But the items within the same difficulty color range here differ in their discrimination. So the light blue item two has a discrimination of one, which is twice as large as the discrimination of the other blue item, and the same thing is true for pink versus purple. 
So for measuring low people, what's the best item? One, two, three, or four. For measuring people low in the trait, what should I pick? Yeah, we got votes for two. I vote for two also. Item two is the one that's more discriminating. So both of these two blue items work for people who are low. The dark blue is worse because it doesn't have a steep slope. It has a lower discrimination. Likewise, if I want to measure people who are average well, which item do I pick, three or four? Four it is, same reason. So to me, this seems reasonable, especially if you're dealing with items that contain words where people have to provide, what was it, feeling integers? What was the phrase? Something along those lines? Yeah. Items in psychology and social sciences where people are trying to convey attitudes and behaviors and tendencies and there's complex sentences that they have to provide some level of agreement to or different types of behaviors where they have to say how frequently they do it. To me, it would be nearly impossible to write items that are equally good when you're dealing with that type of linguistic complexity. If you're dealing with items measuring like three digit addition or something, yeah, I could, I mean, I could imagine all of those items are equally discriminating and you could make them more or less difficult based on whether you had to borrow, you know, or rearrange columns or whatever that stuff is. So this seems reasonable on the face of it. And it's an empirical question whether the items need to have different slopes or whether you can constrain them to all be equal. A one parameter model is a Roche model, says all the A's are equal. A two parameter model, not a Roche model, says all the A's get to be different, items get to vary in their discrimination. Okay, with me so far. So then why would this be a problem? The curves cross. At some point in the continuum, because these curves are non-parallel, that implies they're going to cross, which means that items that used to be more difficult become less difficult and so forth. So for instance, if we look at item, uh, let's go with item three here and follow it, it becomes, it becomes a lower probability. Actually, then let's do these two. We have uh, at the very top here, item one, the, light, the dark blue item right here, that one was supposed to be easier, but it actually results in, there we go, the pink one relative to that. It's actually... Damn it, I can't say it without saying the words. That means I'm tired. I'm going to just read what I said here. Items three and four are harder than one and two at the lower end, but now item one is higher than item four. That's where I was going. This one. The blue is higher than this one. So they're out of order. That's where I'm going. <laughs> I'm out of caffeine and out of order. But the curves cross, which means an item that used to be more difficult may not be the same level of difficulty across the thing. Now, I would argue who the hell cares, because at this point, like you're talking trivial differences in the predicted probability, and these items aren't designed for people who are at a three anyway, so I don't see why that would matter. But to Rosh folks, this is a problem, and that's why this is not cool. So this is the model that has the direct correspondence to the factor analysis literature, because traditionally in factor analysis, loadings are different across the items, and intercepts are different across the items. Here we have the A discrimination slopes that are different across the items in addition to the B difficulties for the amount of trait that it takes to hit the 50-50 mark. There. Okay. Questions so far? No. <laughs> Hey, you found a no button. Excellent. I didn't know they had one of those. <laughs> uh, that one looks like, please don't call on me. That's what that smiley face looks like. 
Cool. I have to, I have to spend some time playing with all the new reactions. It seems like they introduce more and more every time we introduce this, but thank you for playing along. So uh, some other problems that people may not like when it comes to yielding theta estimates. So it is possible if you're using a two parameter model and you try to come up with predicted thetas for each person, and I'm saying it that way because theta is not directly a model parameter, it's the variance and mean across theta that are the model parameters. But if you are dealing with somebody who is has the same number correct, they would have the same theta in Roche scaling in a one parameter model. So anybody who gets say three out of five correct, you'd have the same score. That is not true if your items vary in discrimination because essentially what can happen is that items that are more discriminating will count more towards the prediction of the theta. So you could end up in a situation where two people, one person got more items correct, but their theta is lower because the items that they got correct were easier or less discriminating. And that can be tricky to explain to people. So that's another reason why potentially a simpler model might be used than what fits the data is to resolve these potential ambiguities. So, well, how can I have fewer items correct and have a stronger score than someone else? Well, because you got the right ones correct would be the answer, but that's, that's difficult to work with in, in many practical settings. And then wrapping up for today, there's two more which I'm gonna wave my hands at, but otherwise not talk about because we typically don't use them in anything outside of the educational world. The three parameter model where we pick up, since we already have A and B, what comes next? C. So this one is adding what is known as either a lower asymptote or a guessing parameter, although some people might yell at me for saying that, but that's what it's commonly referred to. And the way that it works is that the probability of a one starts off with this new term C right here. So, and then the rest of the model covers the space after C. So probability equals C, just stop right there, has nothing to do with theta. So C is a lower bound for what the probability would be that we typically would say is zero and this model allows it to be something higher than zero. So when this would be relevant would be something like a multiple choice item where one of the answers is the correct answer and all of the other ones are distractors, but maybe they're not equally distractible. Like some of the distractors are easier to say, to eliminate from your choices than others. So then instead of having say four choices and having a 25% probability of each, if you can eliminate one of them and it switches to 33%, then that item would be easier to get right because of that. So to the extent that items differ in what their lowest predicted probability would be, C can step in to cover those distinctions. So the model probability starts at C and then the rest of it, you know, the other 75% is a function of theta, item discrimination, and item difficulty. It can be very challenging in practice to estimate these models because you need to have enough low people to figure out what C would be. Another way of thinking about it is like, what is the minimum probability for like the lowest possible theta you could ever have? and you need to have a lot of low people to figure out exactly where that would need to be. Um, I note that this was recently introduced into M+. Uh, they, it's called dollar sign two, so like two buck C instead of two buck chuck. For those of you not familiar, two buck chuck is an expression that means very cheap wine, as found at Trader Joe's, for instance. So this is two buck C instead of two buck wine. So then C would introduce curves where they don't shut off at zero, they shut off at some place above zero instead. From what I understand, a 3PL model is very standard in say the GRE exam and probably other nas national testing exams. Um, it doesn't really have applicability if you're measuring attitudes or things like that. Like you can't like guess on a test that has to do with choices about preferences and things. So it doesn't have as much applicability outside of educational measurement, which is why I don't tend to, to focus on it. All right. 
314, I think that's good for today. How about you? Yeah, I think so. Any questions before we call it a day together? Call it a week, even. Nothing coming to mind? All right, well, I will hang out, stopping the share so I can see everybody again. You can see each other, rather. Uh, I will hang out here for a few minutes if anyone has questions. Otherwise, I will see everybody next week, and I will let you know where <laughs> once I figure out what's happening with, with the class and the tech. Does that sound fair? It will likely be Zoom again, though, but with a better Internet. All right. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Let me know if you need anything.